the Saturday Night Live weekend update commentator, and for his movies Dirty Work and Screwed and The Norm Show, please, a wonderful Omaha welcome for Norm McDonald. Hey, Brian. Hey, guys. What's up, man? Hi. Yeah, man, it's live. It's Saturday night. You guys have a bunch of uh, of uh, twinkly things. They didn't tell me everything before I got out here. They didn't tell me that they'd, they'd, there'd be twinkling things. But I can deal with it. But no, listen. I was, uh, it harkened me back listening to uh, the beautiful uh, speaking, like, you know, because I remember that, you know, it's, 10, it's 8 o'clock, and uh, do you know where your children's at and stuff? And it harkened back to me, because a half hour earlier, I was saying the same thing. I was uh, uh, in the restaurant. I was like, it's 7.30, man. Anybody know where my pork chop is? You ever try to get a pork chop at this joint? I mean, I like, you guys like pork? <laughs> you don't like pork? Call yourself Americans? No, listen. i tell you something. I'll tell you something about this restaurant. I don't know about it in here if you get special stuff. But where I was eating, uh, I asked for a Coca-Cola because that's my favorite drink, you know. I go, hey, man, can I have a Coca-Cola? And they say, we don't got that. We got Pepsi-Cola. I was like, oh, and uh, this is a new thing that's happening, I've noticed, across the country. I'd like to get to the bottom of it, because uh, Coca-Cola is, is a delicious drink. And oftentimes, you go to a town, you go, hey, man, where do I go to get a Coke? And they're like, yeah, not here, fella. You know? They have their towns that Pepsi has somehow, even though Coke... And people, see, they think in their minds, they think that if your favorite drink in the entire world is Coca-Cola, then your second favorite drink will be Pepsi-Cola, which is flawed reasoning. Actually, if your first favorite drink is Coca-Cola, your least favorite drink is Pepsi-Cola. That's how it works. And you can tell they're kind of ashamed of you. You got a Coke, they're like, nah, Pepsi, nah. They give you a lot of that. Is that okay? They go, no, I don't want that. What else you got? You got any other soda? And then when they got the Pepsi, they always have these weird other sodas. They go, oh, yeah, we got different. We got, uh, you like root beer? We got that. And then you're like, well, I'm not eight. I don't know. We got Diet Pepsi. What the? Why are you even asking me that? I just said. We got Sierra Mist. Oh, I'm glad, man. I'm glad you brought that up. I was going to ask, but I didn't dare, you know, because every time I go, they don't have it. But that's my favorite drink. <laughs> you know, you go to a restaurant, you go, hey, here's the white fish. What do you want with that? Give me, you got any Sierra Mist? Give me that. What? No Sierra Mist? What kind of hen house horse shit is this? Trying to run a joint here? What kind of business? Honey, get your coat. I'll get the car. I'll bring the car around. You get your coat. No Sierra Mist. Can you believe these characters? Kind of a, kind of a. But no, I had a pork. I had a nice, delicious uh, piece of pork, a pork chop, you know? Pork, I don't know. I don't think it's that good for you, but uh, I like it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's not good for you because it's a pig. But, uh, but I like it. Anything with a snout, I don't think you're supposed to eat. I think that may be in the scriptures. I'm not sure, but I recall something about that. My doctor has me on a snoutless diet right now. 
he says, I got to exercise every day, aerobics and uh, latissimus dorsi, all that shit, you know, get my back and everything, and then no snouts. But no, uh, my friend, I tell you, let me tell you something. My friend, who is a vegetarian, she's a girl, you know, like all vegetarians are, and uh, you don't mean a lot of dudes, you know, but uh, anyway, she was talking to me about the vegetarianism stuff, right? Now, I, have you ever, have you ever had this experience where you think uh, something's right your whole life, you know, and then in a moment, in a flash, you realize you've been wrong about everything you've ever believed ever. Not everything, but that one thing. <laughs> By the way, if you ever wake up and you realize you've been wrong about everything in your entire life, that's not a good day, man. You may as well. May as well go down to the rope store and buy yourself a length of rope. Right? <laughs> then go down to the stool store, get yourself a nice stool. Then you go over to the notepad store, you buy yourself a notepad. You really then you get a pen. You only really need four things. And Must be hard to write those notes. You know, why am I supposed to write it on this little thing? Everything that drove me to end my life. So I can't, I don't know where to start. But, uh, man, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, pork. No, because my friend, who's a vegetarian, this girl, she was telling me, you know, she we always argue because she's a vegetarian, and I am not a vegetarian. And so she, uh, you know, she... Uh, she has her opinions, and I have my opinions, and I realize that her opinions are actually stronger than my opinions. Like, she'll say to me, she goes, you can't eat, uh, you know, animals that, because they're God's creatures too, you know what I mean? And uh, we, you shouldn't uh, destroy another uh, creature of uh, our great God just so that you could have a frivolous meal that would not be necessary. You can't extinguish the life of a, uh, you know, and then I go, I like pork. That's my opinion. That's not a good argument at all. So anyway, the upshot of it is that people can change, thank God, uh, you know, through the glory of God, people can come to changes in life. And I am now a vegetarian, so that's nice, you know. Thank you very much. I'm not a strict vegetarian. I, I eat meat, but I am a, I am a vegetarian, but not a strict one. I only eat meat. You know what I don't like is vegetables. I can't eat those. I can't, I can't stand eating vegetables. So in the strictest term, we're, you know, strictest use of the word, you know, strict, I'm not a strict vegetarian. But you know what she does, uh, my, my friend that uh, is a vegetarian? She makes this thing every Thanksgiving. I don't know if you've ever eaten this. It's called a tofur, tofurkey. Tofu, it's a very it's an unwieldy word. No one likes to hear it. But it's a, it's a turkey, but it's not really a turkey. You know? Sounds like a turkey because it's got a lot of the same letters. But what they do is they take tofu, you see, then they fashion it into the countenance of a turkey, yeah? which doesn't fool me. And also, I don't understand why she does it on account of she's making it into the thing that she doesn't want to eat in the first place. You know, that seems... I would not do that. Like, I'm, I'm against cannibalism, you know? As you all know, as any of you know that follow me on the Google space, WW, I, I have gone across this country with my anti-cannibal stance, you know? Talking to people from one side of this great nation to the other. <laughs> Every year I put my toe in the Pacific and I travel this great land with my uh, anti-cannibal message, you know? Mostly the young people. I try to educate the young people. You know, I go to the schools and I go, listen, 
Listen. You might think that you're going to be the cool guy because you eat a, a dude friend of yours, you know? <laughs> and maybe you will for a couple of years, you know? Maybe you'll be the big man on campus. Oh, that's Jim. He ate a fella. <laughs> but there's more to it than that. No, I have, I, 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 you know, I, I, I use my time for, for, I, you know what I do? I do a lot of charity work for things that, that people, I don't like arguing with people, you know, when they have another opinion than me. So what I do is I pick very popular opinions, and then I work for those people. Like, for instance, there was, uh, uh, you, you know, the landmine big thing? Princess Diana, one of the greatest people who ever lived, she was against landmines. <laughs> so tragically, she died, you know, before her, her landmine crusade really got rolling, you know. And, um, and of course, it was a terrible tragedy and everything like that. And uh, then she died. And I, so I am, hey, how about this? Remember when uh, she died and then Elton John wrote that song for her, but it was the same song that he wrote for Marilyn Monroe? That seems like kind of a jip. <laughs> but the king's like, hey, man, you wrote a song for my daughter? I don't know if there's a king. You, see, you wrote a song for Princess Diana? Yes. Yeah, you, you already? She just died an hour ago. Yeah, I wrote it. I, I, I wrote it. And here it is. Ah, oh, she lived her life like a candle in the wind. Wait a minute. That sounds like that song you wrote about, about Marilyn Monroe. Well, it's a little bit. Some of the same words. Why would you do that? Because they're similar when you think about it. Come on. Marilyn Monroe, she was taking crazy drugs and promiscuous, running around. Man, you know, you never knew if she was going to live or die. She's just living her life crazy like a candle in the wind, you know? And uh, Princess Di, she uh, lived in a castle. But, you know, they're sort of the same. They, they were blonde. I got to go. But anyways. I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, that I am uh, very against landmines. So I will go and I will make, uh, you know, I will go to protests, you know, and uh, I'll have a big sign that says, no more landmines. Because if you don't know about landmines, hey, you're educating me about stuff tonight. I'll educate you a little about landmines, you know, because there's, there's many different causes, you know. And landmines are terrible. What they are is, they put them underneath the earth, and then you step on them, and they blow you up. So I go there, and I protest against them. And what's fun about it is there's very few counter-protesters. You know, there's a couple of guys out there, but clearly these guys are in the, in the pocket of the, you know, big landmine uh, companies in this country. You know? I don't mean to get all Bill Maher on you or anything, but if you think that the landmine companies in this country care about you, the little person, they don't care about you. They care about blowing you up when you're not expecting it. That's how they make their money. No. But, uh, no, I was going to say about she makes this tofu or er, er, tofu. And what I was going to say was that as an anti-cannibal guy, it would never occur to me to do the same thing as she does with her tofurkey. I would not take all my delicious cheese sandwiches and fashion them into the shape of some old rotting corpse of some dude and then, then eat that. That would make it least less tasty than the cheese sandwich itself to me. Huh? 
Well, listen, it's easy to go around saying, hey, I'm against cannibalism. Oh, I'm anti-cannibalism. Look at me. I'm better than everybody else, you know. I know it's easy to say because I say it every day to people. But um, actually, when you think about it, you don't really know how you're going to, you know, how your, how your cannibalism uh, beliefs are going to stand up under um, uh, when it comes up. Because you'll notice in life, cannibalism rarely comes up. There's always some cheese sandwiches around you can find, you know. But what about when you're in the Andes? Well, then all bets are off. <laughs> you have to wrestle with your conscience because you're in the Andes. I don't even know why people go to the Andes, but they do. They go, hi, hey, listen, travel agent, me and the wife, Ruth, you know Ruth, we're going, uh, we got to get away from the kids again this year. We got to go to Ireland. Uh, we were hoping something on the other side of the Andes. Anything you got there? We just want to relax, lay on a hammock or something, and uh, we want to go to a nice place that uh, is separated from where we are now by the Andes. And uh, <laughs> get any small planes? We like flying in small aerofoils. In the dead of winter. You got anything like that? And they're like, yeah. So you get on the plane, and, you know, 20 minutes later, you crash into a mountain, you know, because everyone knows it's, <laughs> it's on the boarding pass. It says, lay over a mountain. Huh. So you crash into the mountain, and then, you know, you got you know, you to wrestle with your conscience, you know, because, uh, you know, you're down there, and the guy in 24E is looking pretty delicious. And uh, and so days turn into weeks, and weeks turn into months. Months, you know how time works, right? I don't have to explain everything. <laughs> then becomes now. So uh, time, tra and then you have to wrestle with your conscience because you're like, ah, my conscience. And your conscience is very, you know, if you, you don't want to wrestle with your conscience because... You know, so, although it's not as hard as wrestling with an actual wrestler. I find. If you have your choice between wrestling with your conscience and wrestling with, a, like, a professionally trained wrestler, I'd take the conscience because it uh, doesn't even have arms. And for wrestling, like if the headlock is the biggest move, if you don't have arms. So anyways, you're wrestling with your conscience, and you're like, oh, man, should I eat that guy in 24E? I don't know. It looks pretty good, but I, I don't think it's right and all this stuff. And then, and then time goes on, and you get, and, and instead of just acting right away, which would probably be the smarter thing, you know, you wait way too long, and months pass, and then you, you go crazy, and then you go after Frank, that's his name, in 24E, and uh, you're just, ah, you're so hungry now, you're tearing into him, you're like, ah, Frank, blood all over you and everything, you know? Anyway, and that's the last, and the, this is what you don't want to hap happen at that point, is for the rescue plane to come over at that very moment, you know? <laughs> well, you're like, ah, what the? They're like, we have hamburgers and hot dogs here on the plane and delicious cheese sandwiches, everything you want here. And you're like, ah, what? A lot of snow. Oh, Lord God. Let me get a, let me get a drink of this water. You like water? Better than that Pepsi shit. Water's good for you. What about guys? You ever just have guys that have their favorite water? They're like, ah, Fiji, that's what I drink. <laughs> water, Fiji water. It's the most tasteless, colorless water of all. 
This one has zero fat, like I'm a retard. Like I, like I wouldn't be able to detect globules of fat in my water. It's cyanide free. No, but listen, man. I'm not afraid of no monsters, you know. You know, you know we spend. When you think about it, man, we spend most of our adult life petrified of monsters, you know. And uh, I'm just coming to the. I'm saying enough, man. You know, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna live under the tyranny of these monsters that uh, uh, walk among us. You know, they get me. They get me. And some of them, I'm not even. I don't even know what's so scary about. I'm like, now they got a movie. I seen Wolfman. You know, which is very scary, right? A Wolfman. You know, they got a movie, and it's like a werewolf. I think it's exactly the same. I'm not sure. <laughs> I haven't studied it close enough, but I believe, like, if a Wolfman came at you and stuff, you went, ah, werewolf. People wouldn't go, ah, it's a Wolfman, you idiot. But my point is this. I am not afraid of a wolf man or a werewolf because when you think about what they are, they're half man and half wolf. So therefore, I am only half afraid of them as I am of a wolf. And there's no movie called The Wolf. <laughs> See, if you got a wolf man, he, half the time he's a man. You can reason with him. Yeah? You can sit down and have a cheese sandwich. But a wolf, man, you can't reason with a wolf. A wolf only wants to eat you. I'm not afraid of a werewolf. I'm not afraid of uh, ghosts. They don't scare me, you know? Not at all. I mean, I don't want to I want to say I'm vulnerable to uh, fear, but uh, eh, they simply don't. Right? You know? First of all, what do they do, you know? They just go, ah. Which, that's not that scary to me. Yeah. And then they're invisible. They're like, ah. And then you're like, what? You're invisible. You can put your hand through them. That, uh, that kind of a person never frightens me. You know the kind of guys that frighten me? You ever meet those guys where you can't put your hand through them? <laughs> I don't care for those fellas. But when I can put my hand through them, it doesn't scare me in the least. Uh, I would do, this is how unscary they are. I was at a hotel a couple of weeks ago. In the lobby, they were saying they they were bragging about there was a ghost in the hotel. You know how scary is can that be? You know what I mean? They're like, oh, every every night, Mary with the blue dress. That was her nickname. She was murdered, and she hangs around the bed, you know what I mean? And she'll come over. And so beware, oh, because Mary with the blue dress, which was her nickname, which was an odd nickname, because you'd think her nickname would be Mary the Ghost. You know. <laughs> when they came time to pick out her nickname, you know, I think they were like, a little. We go, hey, ever what what do you notice about Mary that makes her distinctive? We gotta come up with a nickname for her. I know she wear a lot of blue dresses. She seems to have an affinity toward blue dresses. We're talking about Mary, right? The transparent lady. So I would call her Mary the ghost, and anyway. And all they seem to do is complain, these ghosts. Do you remember what I was I was like, oh, ha, ha, I can't. Everything's wrong. They're never happy or nothing, you know? They're like, I have to, something bad happened to me. And if I don't get it cleared up, I have to travel all through the world in, in pain and sorrow, you know? And then I'm like, well, I do too. What the hell? At least you get to walk through walls and stuff. It's do cool stuff. I think I'll have some more water. I love water. You know, I used to do news on Saturday Night Live, and sometimes people think I know something about news. That's the funny part. 
because I don't know anything about news. And uh, I'll watch it on the TV, and uh, I don't know what they're talking about, you know. And uh, But I watch it all the time, you know. I'll turn on the TV, and then they go, uh, welcome, the deficit. And I go, ha, ha, ha. I've heard that word before. Yeah, that's about But I watch it. You don't have to know about everything, you know. When I was young, you don't have to know about anything. Now you have to know about everything. Everybody got an opinion and stuff. Yeah. Plus, I know about every single... One guy asked me a couple of weeks ago, he goes, Norm, how do you feel about stem cell research? I was like, me? Well... <laughs> Why don't I go, tell you what, why don't I go to scientist school for 10 years, and uh, then I'll come back here to this very spot, and I'll tell you what those three words mean. I don't know. I don't know. That's mostly my answer. And a lot of people don't know. Like you'll see on the, if you ever watch the news, you ever see the news, it's on at 6? They show the news, right? And they'll have a question. And a lot of people don't know, just like me. They'll have a question. They'll, have, they'll show a pie chart. So they'll say, does President Barack Obama deficit reduction? Question mark. Some of that. And they show a pie chart, you know. So you go, oh, man, that looks like a pie. You know, you get happy. And then they have, like, it cut up. And I'll say, like, 47% yes. 48% no. 5%. I don't know. That's like me, you know. No shame in that. No shame at all. Well, I, I phone them every time there's a uh, one of those things on CNN, like one of those polls, I phone up. I want to get on that pie chart. You know, I phone up. I go, hello, excuse me. Is this the TV? Yeah, you just asked me a question. I don't know. How the hell am I supposed to know? I don't even understand most of the words in the question. What's that cost? A buck and a half? Is that what it said at the start of it? Excellent. All right. I better get on that pie chart. I'll tell you that. I don't, I'm not a guy to throw away uh, 12 bits on, you know, on nothing, to tell you quite, be quite honest with you. Nothing. Oh, look at that. So, um, yeah, I don't know a lot about stuff. Like, sometimes when I go to parties and stuff, because everybody got opinions and stuff like that, what I'll do is, I don't want to, I go to parties not to, not to talk opinions with people and elevate myself or anything like that. I go to parties to try to find, try to get me some free sandwiches, you know, because I find at parties, often, you can find, if you look, cheese sandwiches for free. And often what they do is they'll put other stuff in it, and you have to take it out, so you just get the cheese, but whatever, you know. It's free. And uh, so, but the other people I notice, they go there to converse and talk of the issues of the day and so forth like that at the parties, and I don't like that kind of stuff, you know? So I try to, and I don't know anything. See what I mean? So what I'll do is before I go to the party, I just turn on the TV, you know, on the one of them channels with news, and then there's a guy with a suit and a tie. I just say whatever he, he says. I'll say that at the party. And it usually works. I'll just go to the party and everybody will yap and they'll be like, deficit and uh, uh, health care, trillion, trillion, billion. And I go, yeah. Hey, hey, I got an opinion. Listen to this now. I blame the media. Because the media is not entirely... Without following, you think about it. I mean, you know, you gotta, you got you can't just completely say that the media. Is, anybody seen them sandwiches? The fellow over there was telling me there were sandwiches where they cut the crests off and they're in triangles. The fellow over there. And he said they had toothpicks with frilly toothpicks in them. None of his. Not a single one of you. Hey, fair enough. But I have a thing, see, I can. I have a thing where I can judge guys that are at my own smartness level. You know what I mean? Because I don't know if you ever got caught talking to a smart guy. You ever have that happen to you? That's not a lot of fun. 
like you're at a party and you're at that kitchen part where there's that big square thing. I don't know what it is, but you're all standing around. And then there's five of you and three of you leave, and it's just you and the smart guy. And he's, the guy's got a pipe or something. He's like, anyway, how about that leader from the foreign country? What about his name? You're like, ah. I'm going to go ahead and look for them sandwiches. But I'm coming back to talk to you. I'm not running away, if that's what you think. I'm not going to run out that side door right over there and run full speed down the street. No, I think that. No. So what I do, I have a very good, uh, I can, I can uh, go to my own, you know what I mean? The people that are at my smartness levels. So if I'm in a party, right, I can go right into the party and immediately, like they, you know, you know they say gay guys have gay dar, they can sense other gay people. I'm like that with, like, uh, guys of my dumb level. I can walk up, I can just go, immediately I'll say, hey, I bet I can keep up with that guy over there. I'm going to, then I make a beeline over for that character, and then we talk about, uh, you know, Jughead comics or something for a while, I don't know. We have a grand old time, and I try to pocket a couple of cheese sandwiches, and they go. But, um, uh, it's hard to talk to anybody just in regular life, you know? I don't know how to do it, especially, like, one-on-one, -on -one, like, talking, you know? It's so hard to, with people, um, you know, like, like my friend was saying, you got to listen. That's the most important thing in a conversation. Listen to the person that's talking to you. But that's not enough because eventually that other guy will stop talking. I'm good at that part. But, um... And then you go, oh, sorry, I forgot to think of something to say there. You keep talking, and the next time you stop, I'll say something. So you got to do two things at once. So you got to listen to the guy, everything he's saying, plus anything he says that you may know something about, you know, you got to keep that in your head for when he stops talking. You know what I mean? So maybe he's yapping, and all of a sudden he mentions, uh, like, uh, uh, Fonzie or something like that, right? So then, in the back of your head, you go, hey, wait a second, I know something about Fonzie. So as this idiot stops talking, I'll say my Fonzie thing. Excellent. Excellent. Doodly-doo, doodly-doo. Doodly-doodly-doo. Ah. Peace. This is what it feels like, huh? Doodly-doodly-doo. Huh. And then maybe the guy changes the subject. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on a second there. Wait a minute. No, it's interesting what you're saying now. It's interesting. Hey, but what about uh, then? Remember then? It was earlier. And now? You were talking about Fonzie. Yeah, anyways. Interesting thing about Fonzie is this. It's not his real name. Arthur Fonzarelli. That's a true fact, man. You could Google that up on the W. All right, you talk for a while now. You know, it goes on from there. But uh, the news, I mean, some of the news I understand, you know, like, uh, but the, the, that news isn't real news, you know what I mean? It's just odd, crazy, like uh, Tiger Woods. Uh, who's still in it, you know, in this uh, tournament, which is depressing for me because I like Tiger and stuff. And uh, and then, you know, Tiger, this is, Tiger victimized himself, first of all, his family, but, and, and all these women and everything. But he also victimized the golf fan, me, you know what I mean? The guy, I believed in him and I trusted him. And uh, so... It was kind of sad for me because when you, because I, I don't, I don't care if a guy wants to lie down with ladies and stuff like that, you know. I understand that's a thing guys like to do, but I don't like hypocrisy. You understand what I'm saying? I don't like a hypocrite. And to me, Tiger, when I was watching him, he always presented himself to me as a golfer. You know. I always thought he was a great golfer. I watched him my whole, you know, life. 
and he'd be in the sand hitting it out, and then the golf ball come real close, you know what I mean, to the hole. And they put it in, go like that, and everything. So I was all happy. I go, man, that guy's a golfer. People would ask me, who's Tiger Woods? I go, he's a golfer. Right? Now, I had no idea he was leading this double life where by day he was a golfer, and by night he was laying down with ladies. Otherwise, I never would have bought the Buick. <laughs> now I'm driving around a Buick. People snickering at me and stuff, you know? Whatever. No, but he's a, he's a sex addict, and uh, that's a hard one. I imagine, I imagine that's a tough one to kick. <laughs> Wouldn't that be the worst, like those meetings, like a sexaholic, a, what if they have those meetings, what are they going? They always say a holic, it only really works with alcohol. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, like sex, uh, AA, yeah, for sex, that would be a weird, I don't know how that would go. But you know, if you haven't had sex for like a year or something, and then you don't want to hear about some guy's relapse. You know? Guy's like, ah, I've been weak. Oh, no, you don't have to tell us. Ah, I met her in a bar. She was gorgeous. Please. You have to hug the guy. Ah, that's too bad. Oh, that's terrible. Well, we all, uh, whatever. <laughs> But I don't even know if sex, I don't even know if that's a thing. I don't. It's it's weird to me because if, if you're an addict, if you're a heroin addict, you're addicted to heroin. More heroin you do, more addicted you are. Booze addict, you're addicted to booze. More booze you do, bigger addict you are. You know? So to me, if you're a sex addict, let's say, you know, sometimes you meet these guys like, hey, man, this guy's 70 years old, and he's been married since he was 20. Still happy, still have a healthy sex life. Still has sex with his wife, you know, every week or so, you know. Then wouldn't you think that guy's a sex addict? He is a sex addict to such a degree that he's willing to have sex with a 70 year old lady. That's that's hitting bottom there, you know. If you're if you're going around getting a whole bunch of different ladies, that's not a sex addict. That's just a, 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 a beautiful lady addict. I don't know what you call that. But if you're willing to just anything at all, just whatever's beside you after 50 years, you're like, I don't even like you anymore, but ah! Or whatever they do, whatever noise they make. Ah! Man, I don't like those news stories that's scary either, man. That's why I don't like watching the news no more. Because when I was a kid, just news stories be regular, real stuff, you know, like about the world or whatever. But now they'll have little personal stories that have nothing to do with nobody, and they present it as the news, you know, and then you don't want to see them, you know. And I noticed that the latest one they all seem to have, the, the, the show will open the news, and there'll be a guy with a suit and a tie, so you know he's a newsman. And he goes, he goes, hey, our top story tonight, a lady has vanished. And you're like, oh, yeah? <laughs> and they go, yes, she's not, she's gone. Oh, yeah? I am. Do I know her? No. You never heard of her, but we're going to tell you about her. Uh, we got Bill. He's on the outside. They have one guy inside, one guy outside. Bill, what's going on? And then Bill's outside. He's like, uh, yeah, the lady vanished. Her name was Janice. And uh, nobody can find her hiding her hair of her car. Was found in the, the car is fine. It's in the Burger King lot. But we can't find a lady. All right, back to you. And, you know, so then you're at home. You go, well, I don't give a damn on account I never knew her in the first place. How can I possibly care? 
Matter of fact, I'm happy it's her and not someone I know. So, but then they go, we'll tell you about it. You go, no, that's cool, you know. I don't really want to know. But they can't help themselves, you know. They go, here she, oh, hey, Bill, you still outside? And he's like, yeah, of course. And they go, we, we understand you have some friends, a Janice, to tell, tell you about. And yes, we've been uh, t- talking to some of her friends anyways. Turns out she's a good lady. <laughs> Breaking news, Janice was a good lady. And we got some of her friends here going to talk about it. And then they show a lady and says, Janice's friend. And uh, she says, oh, Janice, man, she was the greatest. She was the kind of person where you could walk into a room and she would light up the whole room. You know, it was amazing. She didn't have a light or nothing like that. She would just somehow, (laughs) through sheer tyranny of will, she could uh, make a room light up. Some of us thought it was supernatural, but. And then be, this is other Janice's friend. Oh, Janice. She was the type of lady I remember that you could always turn to. You know how you, sometimes you want to turn your neck, you know, because you're having troubles. You want to, you know, or your neck hurts, whatever. But when you turn, the person you most want to see in your eye line would be Janice, you know. And then, if you say Janice's other friend that wasn't one of the first two. Well, Janice, she, um, She's the kind of person, you could be talking to your best friend the whole world, you know? And uh, then Janice comes in and goes, screw you, I'm talking to Janice. You know, you go over to Janice, she's a better person than you. It's Janice. And so, that, then, so then, at home, you start to get invested in Janice. You start liking her, you know what I mean? And uh, every day they show you more about Janice, you know? And they show different video, home videos of her, and you're like, hey, honey, look! Oh, I like that hat she's wearing. She's eating a piece of pizza, you know? And you start really liking her, you know? You go, ah, man, that's, that lady's nice. I'd like to meet her one day. That'd be, oh, I forgot she vanished. Oh, well, they'll find her. I'm sure of this. Then you get hope, you know, and you can't, all you can think about is Janice. You know? Your feverish dreams are... <laughs> are commanded by Janice's spirit, you know? You can't even think right, you know? And every day you're turning on the news, man, what's going on with Janice? And they keep going and telling, you know, and things progress, you know, and Bill's still outside, and he's like, we're still looking, it's been three weeks now, but as as we speak, the uh, there, everyone's combing the woods behind me as we speak, and then you're at home, you're oh, no, not the woods. You don't like to hear that. Nothing good ever happens in the woods. I've seen enough of these stories to realize that Janice is not going to come bounding out of the woods anytime soon. <laughs> it's like, hey, what's going on, everybody? I was just taking a stroll through the woods. What's going on? Why are you taking pictures of me anyway? What's going on? Now, if they find you in the woods, generally, they find you in one spot. As a matter of fact, exclusively, every time. If you're found in the woods, you're found in a shallow grave. That's the way it works. I don't know why, but I've seen enough Bill Curtis specials to know that shallow grave is where you end one. Certain things you don't want on your uh, death certificate. One would be shallow grave. Massive. You wouldn't want to see that on your death certificate, the word massive. Or maybe you would. I don't know. Maybe that would be a good one. What about complications? That's the one that always confused me. I'm like, what the fuck? You go, hey, Doc, would my dad die again? It's complicated. Complications. He died from them. Well, how'd that work? I... You told me it was going to be a simple operation. Yeah, we thought it was. You're not a doctor, are you? It looks simple in the book. But once we cut them open, man, uh, 
lot of red stringy stuff in your dad. Very complicated when you get in there, really. Well, anyways, goodbye. So, uh, but, uh, yeah, you don't want to see a shallow grave in, in any of your, you know, in any of the fourth estate's account on, uh, on your uh, being dispatched. So, uh, the, and also, doesn't it seem a little rash, a shallow grave, you know? Like after all their planning, these these serial killers—they're supposed to be so cunning, you know, so so diabolical, according to the TV movies I've seen. And uh, doesn't it seem a little rash at the end that all of a sudden it's just shallow grave, you know? It's just wouldn't you think they'd be, go to a little? Yeah. There's like there you go, a couple of leaves and a twig. That look doesn't look like Janice. I don't remember Janice having twigs and leaves all over. Nobody will find her. <laughs> a Boy Scout ain't going to stumble over her tomorrow morning. I know that much. I'm going home and uh, await the authorities. And then uh, they go home. Now, I would, if I ever did that, and I would never slaughter and kill a woman. I want you to know that. I know I say that now. Who knows? <laughs> Can't predict the future. I know. I know there's not a, a river long enough that does not contain a bend. But I believe right now, I would not slaughter a woman. And maybe it's just vanity talking. You know, the scriptures say that man is mostly vanity. But uh, um, in my vanity, I do not believe I would do it. You know. But if I did do it, if I somehow snapped, because who could, who would ever know? I would plan it out. I'd be very, very careful uh, about it. You know? But I would track the lady, you know, because because you know, there's still a stigma even in today's enlightened society uh, when you uh, slaughter a lady. So I would track the lady. You understand? I would find out. This is what you got to do. You got to find out. Her her uh, habits, you know, like maybe you go, hey man, I know she goes to that cheese sandwich store every day, and when she comes back, she's got a big paper bag of stuff. I bet you ain't those cheese sandwiches in there, eh? So then you put that up in your head. Lady likes cheese sandwiches. One piece of information, but you take your time. You know? Then you notice you see another pattern. You go, hey. Every Wednesday night, that lady goes down to the gymnasium and plays basketball with other ladies, which is fine nowadays. So, what I would do is I would stand outside of the gym, you know, and she'd come out there all sweaty with a ridiculously tricolored ball, you know, and, uh, and she'd be finished her game, and then... Where would I be? I'd be standing at the other side of the parking lot, and in my hand, what do you think would be resting but a cheese sandwich, right? So then she'd go, hey, what's in your hand? i go, what, nothing? She'd go, yeah, there's something in your hand. i go, there's not, there's nothing in my hand. I don't know what you're talking about. She'd go, there's something in your hand. I'm not blind. I see something in your hand. i go, there's nothing in my hand. Oh, yeah, this. Oh, no, it's just a cheese sandwich. What, why, you like them or something? I got a whole bunch in that van over there. Yeah, that craziest looking van you've ever seen in your life. It's right over there. You know how it goes? <laughs> and by the way, if you ever do this, and I don't think you ever should, you you don't have to have cheese sandwiches in the van. You know, unless you're proud of your detailed work or something like that. I don't want you to go. If you're a frugal serial killer. I'm the last that would advise you to th throw away all kinds of money on uh, on cheese and double the amount on bread, you know? Should bread and cheese cost the exact same amount of money? But uh, anyways, I would plan it out. That's, my, that's what I'm saying. And then I would take the lady in the, and I would never do this, of course, uh, but I would take the lady in the van to a remote 
area, you know, where there was a wooden shack that I had constructed, and uh, and uh, it was silenced to the point that her screams would just echo off the walls, never to reach civilized ear again. And uh, then I would do whatever it is that they do that gives you that godlike power. And then I would take her to the woods and I would bury her in the deepest grave ever. That would be most of my plan. The grave. Like two years before I had selected a victim, I would be working on the grave. I'd get 50, 100 foot grave. As a matter of fact, if I had any sense in my head, as my dad used to say about me, I would start digging the grave now. Just in case. Because you never know when you're going to snap. I should go home and just <laughs> dig a big, deep, 100 foot grave. Yeah? And worst case scenario, like my dad used to say, hey, a little, a little hard work never hurt anybody, goddammit. You know? And best case scenario, I, uh, you know, I slaughter a lady. Get away. If you're gonna, if you're gonna slaughter a lady, and I'm completely against it, it's much better to slaughter a lady and get away with it than slaughter a lady and not get away with it. That's just, I, I don't know, because I've not, I've not done either. You know, I would have to talk to one of you that have done both <laughs> to really get an answer. But I would, I would suspect, like anything, not getting caught, you know, is, is the better choice than getting caught. Ugh. You know, it's funny, you know, the things we think we're afraid of, you know? Because, uh, the things we're really afraid of in life, like monsters, you know, and uh, serial killers and uh, terrorists and stuff like that, they, they ain't going to do nothing, you know? Like, what's the chances, really? You know what I mean? But you're always afraid, like earthquake, uh, tsunami. I was afraid of this crazy stuff. But you're not, the stuff that really gets you, you're not afraid of. You don't even think about it, you know? Like, you think, you're always like, man, I hope a terrorist doesn't attack and kill me, right? What's the chance of that happening? Like, one in a billion? You know, you, terrorists ain't going to attack and kill you, you know? But what's the chance that you're going to be attacked and killed by your own heart? At 100%? <laughs> yeah, nobody even thinks about that. Nobody even cares about it. Your heart can attack and kill you. And yet people like their hearts, you know. They give it for Valentine's. Oh, a heart. Ooh. People go, man, that guy's got a big heart. I go, you better fucking watch out on account of I could kill him. Does he know that? That it will attack and kill him when he's not expecting it at all? That's what happened to my dad. His heart attacked and killed him. It was tough. Um, I don't know if you ever loved anybody, but uh, when you love somebody and then their heart attacks and kills them, man, it makes you sad. And uh, my dad, I love more than anybody, and he never saw it coming, you know. He never, he thought his heart was on his own side. He was looking around for terrorists, shit like that. And, uh, and it was just one time, boom, his heart got him. He was lying in his bed, and boom, by the time he hit the floor, they say he was dead. And I saw him, I was the second guy after my mom to see him. And I was, oh, blood, it was black. I thought it would be red. And he was lying there, and I was so sad. It was the most saddest moment ever. And um, it was too late. He was dead already, you know. And, uh, and then the people came in the white, they, they wear white. They're not doctors, but they wear white. And uh, it was too late. And they just tried to make it feel better, you know. They just say anything, you know. Like one guy was like, don't worry, Norm. He, uh, he never felt a thing. He died in his sleep. And then I was like, really? When his heart attacked and killed him? Because I... I wake up if my cat walks across my belly. So I... I don't know if my dad was that sound a sleeper. And another guy said, don't worry, Norm. He's in a better place. I say, he's on a floor. Dead. Earlier, he was alive on the 
dad with the Tempur-Pedic pillar I got him for Christmas. I'm not a doctor, but uh, I think that's the worst place. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because I have my, I have my faith. So as long as I have my faith, you know, I'm all right. As long as you have faith, if you don't have faith, forget it. But uh, you can have other things, I guess. You guys drink booze? If you don't have faith, like I have faith, you know, I have deep faith. But if I didn't, I think I'd go for booze. <laughs> because uh seems like, you know, like a good thing. My buddy, everybody has diseases. My buddy has alcoholism, which is a disease. And he told me that. He said, Norm, I got a disease of alcoholism. You know, it's taking over my life. And it is a disease. You know? But I was trying to look on the bright side of things. And I told him, I said, listen, Bobby, his name's Bobby. I said, you know, it's true. You got a disease and everything, you know. But you got to look at the bright side because that's what I believe in. Uh, and uh, as far as diseases go, I think you got the best one, I told him. It's the only disease where you get to drink a lot of booze all the time. As a matter of fact, that is the disease. Just drinking booze. Not exactly bowel cancer. You know, like my, my Uncle Basil, he has bowel cancer. I would not, and I don't think my buddy Bobby, the alcoholic, would ever go to my Uncle Basil and go, hey, I hear you got bowel cancer. I know how you feel, man. I drink booze. Those diseases, good Lord. What are your symptoms? I, my bowel hurts a lot and I bleed from the bowel. How about you? I get happy. And sometimes I, get, I, meet, I go somewhere, I meet someone that has the same disease as me, and then I have sex with them that night. That's in the latter stages of the disease. Uh, listen, man, I'm just an old chunk of coal, you know. I'm going to be a diamond someday. Don't worry about it. It'll happen through the, through the grace of God, you know. You guys like God? I mean, you do God's work, you know, even if you don't know it. I, uh, I have always been very religious, you know. But I'm a specific religion. I don't want to tell you what religion, you know, because I don't know if my religion is the exact correct one. Even though I know there's a God for sure, I'm not 100% sure that my guy is the right guy. And Actually, that's one of my biggest fears is after I die, I get up to heaven, I'm like, oh, God, not you. I, I thought it was the other fella. What? Oh, God, what a... He was a good public speaker. You got to admit that. Not him at all. No. Oh, well, how about that? So what now? I got to get raped by the devil forever or something? That's my worst fear, you know. I try to, you know, I try to do good and I try to, even though I'm an old chunk of coal, I, I want to be a diamond someday. You know? I want to be the world's best friend. Go around shaking everybody's hand. You know what I mean? I'm going to be a good guy. But uh, maybe God, or even an old wretch like me, or something. But uh, you guys do things for children. What's better than children? I have a child. I had a child. I do. I still have one. He's like 10, 15, something like that. Time goes by so quickly. You know, you can't. It's hard to remember details. But he's a, he's beautiful. When you have a child, man, you got love. It's unbelievable. You know, you never had it before. You realize you've never had it once you have it. You know, like when you have a child, you go, "Oh my God, what the hell is that?" You know, like you. I know you used the word love before and everything like that, but you're like, "Whoa, that is something." And then your single friends, they don't understand. You go, "Hey, Jim, man, you gotta get one of these. This is the craziest feeling I ever had." Like I just all through my body, all I feel is like happy. And then the guy goes, is it like crystal meth? And you go, no, what? I don't want to be your friend anymore, friend. No. This. This. 
love. This, so this is love. And then actually, sometimes you have a, this is the, the flip side of it, the bad moment, because you ever look, you said earlier that you loved other things before you saw this, you know, which is what you really love. And uh, so there's always a bad moment when you're looking at that, and then you look over at your wife. You ever do that? You're like, oh, look at this. I love, that's love. Oh. Hey there, lady, what's going on there? Yes, this is it. <laughs> and it makes sense, you know, because it's pure and as it doesn't lie. It's you, and blood, and DNA, and Aunt Hazel. Nose part right there, and everything. So how can that compete with some lady that you met in a bar one night? How can that possibly compete with that? Ah, the children. Funny, like you can't love children anymore. Because, you know, even though Jesus, and I, I'll tell you something, I don't want to say any specific religion is better than all the false ones. But <laughs> this is the only religion I'll tell you that I am against. The Church of Satan. Any retard knows that's not the right one. I think even Satan himself admits it. Anyway. Um, uh, you know, so Jesus was, uh, that's, one, that's one of the only, uh, I think it's the only religion that puts children at the core, you know, of uh, their religion, you know. They love children. So um, that's good because I love children. But I, when, I, when my child was young, I was always worry, always worry, always worry, you know. I remember when he was really young and uh, I was worried about everything. I remember one time, like he was only four days old or something, I was watching TV and they, did a, they had a news story that said, Coming up, a new story on crib death. And then I was like, that's where my kid sleeps. You would think crib death would put a crimp in the sales of cribs. If not wipe out the entire industry. That's what I would think. Yeah? A couple of Toyotas go skidding around. All of a sudden, they can't sell cars. But the crib industry, incredibly resilient, actually kills children. One of its, one of its defects. <laughs> I'm calling for, for a full recall of all, all the cribs that have killed the children. Oh, man, I'm thirsty. <laughs> la, 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 la. Yeah, yeah, so I'd probably drink. If I, if I wasn't a, a person of faith, you know, I'd probably drink a lot of booze and stuff like that. Yeah, I'd do something. And... Uh, Yeah, I don't like drinking though. You ever drink those those little shooters that are really like powerful and they have like sex names? They have like filthy names. You know what I'm talking about? So they'll be they'll have like sex on the beach. You know what I mean? And so I don't know why they name them like that. I guess because people are drunk and they're like, hey, maybe if I drink that, that will happen to me. But uh, of course. If you have a night of drinking, you're not going to end up having sex on the beach. That's never happened in the history of recorded time. You know? But, you, can, you know, you're not going to have a, a shooter bar where you go up and go, yeah, excuse me, can I have a uh, hump and a dude I figured was a lady? I swear to God, I thought he was a lady. And... Uh, also, my friend will have a senseless knife fight. You got one of them? 
Give me one of them. But, uh, oh. You know what? I don't like drinking. I don't like drinking. Because I like, I, I can't drink. I go on the road so often, you know, because I'm a stand up comic. And, uh, I'm, also, I'm also a dangerous drifter. So, my, my hobby and my work dovetail very nicely. I drift from town to town, across this great nation, you know, and I do some stand-up comedy. So I'll be in a town, and the you know, policeman feller will say, how long are you in for? He'll, he won't know that I do stand-up. He just knows me as a drifter. Because I see you're in town, huh? I go, yeah, yeah. Because how long are you going to be here? I go, just till Monday. Yeah, I work down there. I got a job, see? I got a job. Well, you can ask Vic. I'll be asking Vic. And I want you out of here Monday morning the time you say you're going to be out of here. I will, sir. I will. And off I go. But, uh, but what I was going to say was that, you know, as I travel this great nation, you know, you know what I would like to do, actually, is... If there is a Great Depression, is that coming, by the way? Because you guys seem to know more than me. Like, um, will there be a Great Depression? Like, like, will I be carrying around at some point a stick with a thing on the back of it? And will I be like, will I uh, be hanging around big, big garbage cans with fires? And making uh, hot dogs with them and sharing them with my friends and ganging together. You know, we got to gang together in case the other gangs get us. No? I don't know. Keep seeing things on the news. Got to prepare myself. What about those things you see on the commercials where you go, I think everything's like retarded now because uh, something's happening weird, you know? Like, you ever see where they'll go, like, uh, have a guy in the commercial, and he goes, uh, goes, hey, you like gold? And you go, yeah. You go, you ever think of getting gold? Keeping it? It's worth a lot of money. And you go, yes, of course I've thought of that ever since I was five. Daffy Duck. I first thought of it when I watched Daffy Duck when I was five. Ah, well, you should get gold. I'm G. Gordon Liddy, and uh, I broke into the Watergate Hotel. You like gold? I don't even know why the guy. <laughs> what about guys that, uh, I was going to say guys that do commercials where they're, you know when guys are old and they do commercial, you kind of feel sorry for them, you know? Because they're old. Like, remember the $6 million man? Right? That guy was worth $6 million. No, he's an actor, but he played the $6 million man. So when he got this, he goes, hey, man, what's the role going to be? You're going to be a guy worth $6 million. Sit, your arms are the best arms and your eyes, everything. So he's feeling good about himself, you know? He's like, yeah, that's pretty cool. You know? Because... A, a regular man is not worth $6 million. You'd be surprised to know this, but an actual regular person, if you just took them down to their trace elements, you know what a, a human body's worth? It's only worth like a couple of hundred thousand dollars. So, but this guy was worth $6 million. So now, anyway, I've seen him on the commercial. He sells the bionic ear. <laughs> so this is kind of sad to me, you know, that he was at one time, you know, Oh, uh, Hollywood, $6 million man. And now he's like, I don't hear too good. You want to buy this? The bionic ear. And, of course, you get jib because you think of the bionic ear from the show. Or it's like, do, 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 do. And you can hear from a long way away. You know how you could tell the bionic man was fast, by the way? This is kind of a neat trick they did that seems very counterintuitive. 
But at the start of the uh, Bionic Man, they'd show a collage of how powerful he was. To, sh to show how fast he ran, they would show him running in slow motion. So you'd be like this, da -da, and you go, God damn, that guy's fast. Go, Man, I wish I could run that fast. How does he run that fast? So I, was, so I always feel sorry for those guys. That, uh, yeah. What about those guys that have to do, they get so old, they do those commercials for, for old guys that can't get insurance and stuff? That's a bad job. Ed McMahon had it for a while, then he died. You know, after that job, generally, he'd die. But because uh, they pick an actor that's going to die soon, so he can relate to the. But uh, so now it's Alex Trebek or something, but it's always like, and, and, the, and, and they're trying to get old people, really old people, to get insurance that it appears they shouldn't be entitled to. And uh, so it's always like, hey, have you never been accepted once? Everybody decline you because you're so close to death? <laughs> Anyways, uh, we want you. We don't, I don't know why, but it uh, costs $2 a year, and uh, we don't make a lot of money, I'll be honest with you. My father started the business, and he was worth $6 billion six years ago, and he blew it all with this ridiculous venture. Anyways, so listen, guys, in, uh, in honor of the children, you know, because, hey, the children are our future, and I believe that. I don't really believe that because they told me that when I was a kid, and it didn't work out. But I will tell you, uh, I will tell you a joke that a kid told me in a sick uh, kid's hospital. He told me this joke, and he promised me to tell you, and uh, he's going to see his savior. Or I mind problem. But his joke is this. This is his joke. He goes, it's a funny joke, and then I'll leave you. But you guys have been great. Thank you so much. So here's the joke. The joke is this. The, a dog walks into a telegram office, Western Union, I suppose. And uh, he didn't know. And uh, he said, uh, and, the, and the, so the telegram guy goes, hey, what kind of, uh, what do you want me to write in your telegram? So the dog goes, woof, 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 woof. So the guy writes it down, you see. And he says to the dog, he goes, hey, dog, I can't help but notice here. There's only nine words on your telegram, you know. Ten words or less, it's the same price. If you would like, I could add an extra woof, you know. And then the dog goes, but that wouldn't make any sense. Why would I? Most of his brain stem was gone. He wasn't making a lot of sense. But he was a child. They said he was more host than virus. I don't even know what that means. I'm not a doctor, but <laughs> no such child exists. All children are. All children are. All children are beautiful, except the evil ones. I like all children, except British children. I don't like those British children because they remind me of the devil. They're very evil. And, uh, you know, I grew up with the omen and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, when the omen was uh, young, Damien, you know, it was, uh, it was all scary and everything. You know? And uh, then later, I did omen two, and he's a little older, he's still frightening. And then he was like 13 in the third one, and then he was frightening. And they did one. He was an adult. He wasn't frightening at all. Interesting, huh? <laughs> you would think that, that, you know, human beings would become more evil as time went on. You know? You wouldn't think that the embodiment of evil would be inside of a child. But, you know, I think that's I think that's just the uh, celluloid pictures we get. I think in reality, as the scriptures say, children need us. So um, let me think of a joke.
seems fair. Oh, I know. There was a guy <clears throat> who had a great pig, man. This guy had the greatest pig in the world. And uh, so a guy came to his house and said, man, I hear you got the greatest pig in the world. So the farmer goes, are you kidding? You talking about Bill? And the guy goes, I don't know, man. I just heard it was a pig. I didn't know his name. He goes, yeah, his name is Bill. Bill the pig. And uh, this pig, man, he's the best. He goes, why do you say that? How come you say that? You got any examples? He goes, I got examples. He goes, last summer, man, he goes, the, our child fell into the well, you know, and was in the well. We didn't even know, and the pig came running. I was at the back 40, hoeing, and the pig grunted and snorted, and I came, just got my son out just in time. God bless that pig, you know. The pig had a wooden leg, by the way. I forgot to tell you that part. And uh, so uh, and then he goes, uh, yeah, that's interesting, but he's got a wooden leg. He goes, let me tell you more about the pig. He goes, uh, then another time, he goes, that pig saved my life, man. I was under the tractor, and a pig with his own weight pushed up the tractor and hurt his spine. He had disc issues later, but he did it for me on account he loves me. And he goes, well, but still, you only got the one, uh, the wooden leg. Never mind that, the guy says. He says, listen to my stories about the pig. He goes, this pig, well, you know, last summer, the big fire, you heard about the big fire? You never heard about it? It was a big fire. It was a big fire all down the, the rural Route 20 here, and it hit our house the worst. Anyways, the wife and I are very sound sleepers, and we didn't hear anything. And if it weren't for the pig who hit his snout on the window outside of our bedroom, hit it with such uh, ferocity that it smashed the window open, and we escaped, you know, the black, black smoke... then we would not be alive today. Why, why we, 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 be, we belong to this pig. This pig, we would not exist without it. It's, it's our most prized possession, if you could even call it that. We love that pig more than anything. And so then the guy said, but I still don't understand. How come it's got a wooden leg? And then the guy says, are you kidding me, man? Have you even been listening to me? You can't eat a great pig like that all at once. You know? You not heard a word I've said? What is wrong with you? Hey, folks, you've been great. God bless. Keep up the good work. And uh, may God save your soul.